Hi and welcome to the show. If you're new to this channel, my name is uh, Berge Fogli. I'm a Norwegian strength, nutrition and mindset coach with uh, more than 25 years of experience. And uh, today I have a special guest, Christopher Barakat. Did I pronounce your name right? Yeah, perfect. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, Chris is a 32-year-old competitive natural bodybuilder, pro bodybuilder, a published scientific researcher at the University of Tampa, and an educator in the field of exercise and nutritional sciences. Chris is known for his expertise in bodybuilding, sports nutrition, and muscle growth, has also been involved in uh, a lot of interesting studies, academic research, particularly in areas related to physique enhancement, sports performance, and nutritional strategies for bodybuilders and athletes. So, Chris, welcome to the show. I'm really uh, honored that you wanted to have a chat with me. No, thank you for having me on, man. I've been following your work for a long time, and it's awesome when, you know, two worlds collide and we try to make the field a little bit better, give good information to people tuning in. So thank you for having me on, man. Yeah. I mean, just talking to uh, Josh on the previous episode um, and seeing, you know, I've been following his, him for a while. Um, you know, obviously, he, he, uh, he's he been studying the MyRaps protocol. So that's how we kind of connected. And then I mm -hmm. saw that you've been coaching him and you've been also coaching a lot of uh, great athletes. I've, I've seen some amazing before and afters and you post a lot Thanks, of interesting man. content. So I figured you would be a good uh, guest on my show. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so I, I guess we'll just jump straight in. There's um, many directions we can take this in, but um, I, I guess first off, obviously you're researching this stuff. I mean, you're actually measuring it and, and it's not just bro science, you know? So I, I just want to start off asking how has your academic research influenced your approach to bodybuilding and training? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, one thing I, I'll kind of lead off and say is when I was younger and I had less experience in the research field, I actually gave more value to the conclusions that other authors were coming up with based on the actual objective data and the data that they were collecting. So um, it's not that I don't value it anymore by any means. I, I value it very much so, but I understand um, the limitations and I don't get overly excited just because of like one randomized control trial. Um, and I also just think a lot of people want to find that next new exciting training method. Um, and a lot of the, a lot of methods work and the reasons why they work are because of the principles and the foundations that are there. So Sometimes I think some, some people get too caught up in uh, some of the new novel techniques that may be coming out or some of the new research that may be coming out. And there can be a lot of uh, confounding variables that impact the results of that actual study. And then when you actually want to practically apply it, um, it might be a little bit more complex than saying, all right, I'm just going to start this new method because this research study found that it was superior to a different or a more traditional method. That's that's a great point. And I mean, um, the new shiny object syndrome, I uh, posted about it on social media before. And um, it, it's it's kind of frustrating because it, it's almost as if people value that more than like you and me that's been in the trenches for a while. And uh, this came up when I talked with Cliff Wilson, who's also, you know, been coaching for 14 years. And uh, like what he said, um, he kind of stopped looking at research a long time ago because mm. it, it didn't actually, you know, he was tired of always having the smaller guys on stage. And I guess you kind of have to keep in mind that uh, a lot of studies use uh, subjects with, um, um, you know, they, they call them recreationally trained and uh, we don't know whether they're able to really push themselves really hard in the gym. Uh, we don't really know if, if their, you know, lifestyle supports their training. 
And obviously, we're all human. So on a fundamental level, we're all responding the same way to you know, lifting weights. But but there are so many confounding variables that will uh, dramatically, in some cases, change the response that we actually um experience in the gym especially when you know we're, we're working with more advanced uh lifters yeah. and even in ourselves you know you having uh, a pro bodybuilding title and um having seen perhaps a, a divergence between what the research says and what actually works in the gym so uh, <laughs> are there any <clears throat> Like the debate now rages on. It's like high versus low volumes. It's um, stretch mediated hypertrophy, uh, and and it, it's it's kind of you know they're they're kind of separating into different camps where mm -hmm. they're just throwing rocks at each other. And I'm kind of more in the middle, or not trying to be diplomatic, but at least. Can we try to figure out a way to individualize? First, agree on some general principles and then try to figure out perhaps systematically how we can approach training nutrition in a way that we can bring out the very best in each individual. So I, I would kind of like to hear your take on both the current state of affairs and how you um, um, approach uh, the tr first of all the training process what, what's kind of your your philosophy here sure so uh, something that came to my mind while you were you know asking that question and sharing some of your thoughts was how like the pendulum kind of constantly swings from one side to the other and uh before we dive into resistance training really quick i want to kind of share how at least you know 10 plus years ago maybe 11 12 years ago high intensity interval training for cardio was preached by many like evidence-based scientific people in the space to be superior for fat loss or like a better strategy for fat loss. And then over the years, they started saying, oh, as long as the same amount of calories were burned within that cardio session, the fat loss is going to be equated. And then people started actually kind of, um, moving away from ever using hit cardio because it's too fatiguing and it's going to negatively impact your training. So you went from this training method, this cardiovascular method for fat loss being better than low intensity, then to it being, Oh, as long as things are equated from a caloric pr perspective, they're equal. It doesn't really matter which tool you use. And then hit was actually kind of demonized and, Oh, it's too fatiguing. Never use hit just do low intensity stuff. So that's just one example that came to mind. And um, I, I share just that like, because like pendulum. I still use just like the pendulum. And I think it's important that we, we always understand how each tool works and when to use them. So like I personally utilize hit cardio for a lot of my athletes and low intensity steady state for that same athlete, just super, super context dependent, what phase in the prep they're in, um, how do they respond? What's the rest of their training split? How is it going to impact their subsequent training sessions, so on and so forth. So I think it's just important for people to understand all of these methods are tools. And then you need to experiment with yourself and or with your clients to see how it's going to produce results for them, how it's going to enable them to progress, potentially hinder them to progress and what other uh, dials do you need to turn up or down? So like we can chat about things like myo reps or stretch mediated hypertrophy or long length partials rather than just using like, Oh, all I do is rest pause and myo rep training mm. or now shifting over to, yeah, I'm not really doing full range of motion movements. I'm just doing long length partials. It's like, no, you can utilize all of these tools within your training program, depending on the context and, when is it going to serve that client or that athlete best? Like when does it make the most sense? Yeah, that's a great perspective on it. And it's like this dichotomous thinking that either you do it or you don't do it at all instead of, you know, trying to figure out like the overall picture and what tools can you use to uh, push in a certain direction. So, so I yeah. really like that that perspective. I, I wish more would adopt that mindset instead of 
you know, struggling to push this new shiny object uh, thing all the time. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, so just to sort of get a general idea, where where are you on the spectrum in terms of? Let's start with like training volume, loads, and frequency, like for the three main variables. Sure. Okay, so I think my thoughts on training volume or my philosophies might be a little bit different than some of the people in the space for sure, to some extent, to some extent. Um, I think there's a couple interesting things at play. So when you are a beginner, we do know that you don't need much volume to get a positive response because it's very novel stimulus and you can make progress with low volumes, uh, relatively speaking. As you become more experienced and your training age increases, you become an intermediate, your strength goes up, you might need a little bit more volume to continue to progress at a decent rate. Um, I think a lot of that just comes down to practicing movement patterns and improving the skill and the neuro coordination required for certain movements over time. I don't think um, you necessarily need to do more working sets, but it's a it's kind of a double-edged sword. So I think when you are a beginner and you are an intermediate, your skill level for training very close to failure isn't really there anyway. Um, that's something that develops over time. So I think doing moderate amounts of volume for intermediates works very, very well because they don't necessarily understand what true concentric failure looks like and feels like and what it takes mentally to go there on a consistent basis. Mm. So training at moderate volumes at moderate to high ish intensities works really well. But I think once you have somebody who has passed that intermediate stage and they are becoming more advanced and they are becoming pretty darn strong, I do think keeping the number of sets per exercise per session per week might not be sustainable if they're lifting very heavy loads and they are training at higher intensities over time. So mm. as long as you're kind of managing your intensity and your volume appropriately, lots of things can work. Um, but everybody always wants to know what's best mm. and that's absolutely up for discussion. Right. But I think the point I was trying to make is when you're a beginner, your volume and intensity can be low and you're still going to progress yep. as you're an intermediate, your volume likely needs to increase a little bit and you learn how to train more and more intense over time and your intensity of loads will increase because your strength is increasing. Yep. However, once you are very skilled, you are strong, you have a lot of muscle. I think you can get away with doing less volume mm, because the quality point. of every set and the stimulus that you're accruing from every rep and every set and every session is higher anyway. Mm -hmm. So the whole inverted U concept um, is something that I kind of can see work in practice for a beginner, intermediate, advanced. I don't, I don't think super, uh, I don't think your training volume needs to be very, very high just because you are more advanced. I don't think it needs to be this perfectly linear relationship. Hmm. That's, that's a great point. And, uh, cause as I've been saying also with Josh and, and Cliff that, uh, you first need to consider proximity to failure before we even start discussing volume. Uh, and also, yeah. <clears throat> you know, what's a moderate volume? What's a high volume? You you can throw around, you, you know, you can show someone a workout. Um, like I had Cliff coach me for a while now. And um, yeah, I started doing his program and, and my approach had been like zero to one RIR, like really close to failure. And then he prescribed programs, you know, calling for two to four sets per exercise and two to four exercises per muscle group per session and i was going balls to the wall you know like i was used to and, and you know it kind of dawned on me that hey you you, you kind of need to you know read the descriptions it's it specifically says one to four reps in reserve so you, you should actually stay at a certain load and and perhaps only get close to failure on, on the last set of the last exercise gotcha. so that kind of so it, it's not really high volume with that 
in uh, taken into account. Uh, it, it's more like well, it, it, it's more like one to two really hard sets instead of yeah four times four. You know, so so we, yeah. we kind of need to to speak on common ground before we start to define what's high and low volumes. I guess. Yeah, for sure. And I think when you have a beginner and an intermediate, uh, the number of exercises that they perform within their entire training program can also be a lot fewer. Like you you can select many fewer exercises or or less exercises in total compared to somebody who's more advanced. So like if we, let's just use the back as a quick example. Like if you have a beginner, I think as long as you have some sort of vertical pull, some sort of horizontal pull, and then maybe a hinging pattern. That's a great start for someone who's just getting started. But for someone who's more advanced, they're going to want to hit maybe two different kinds of vertical pulls or a vertical pull and a high diagonal pull, and then an upper back focused horizontal row, and then a lat focused horizontal row, and then maybe a low diagonal row, and maybe an isolated pullover. So the exercise Mm -hmm. selection... I, th- I think the requirements go up as you become more advanced I agree. Um, because yeah. you're not trying to just hit, you know, a compound exercise that does give you a good bang for your buck. But when you're really trying to optimize every single region of a complex muscle group or of any muscle group, you're going to need more exercise. So then it becomes, okay, you can add more exercises but maybe you perform one or two less working sets. So like Mm. if you used to do four sets of lat pull down and four sets of rows, and that was the majority of your back work as a beginner or intermediate, that's eight working sets in a a training session. Let's say Mm. as you become more advanced, maybe you keep it eight working sets, but now you're doing two vertical pulls, two high diagonal rows, two upper back rows, and then two low rows for lat. So you're still um, providing a different stimulus. You're targeting different regions and and biasing different regions to a different extent, but you're keeping like the total session volume pretty similar. Mm -hmm. So there's so many ways to go about it, but I think you need to uh, experiment with a lot of these things and and see what you get a good result with. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And just to kind of max out the different segments of a muscle, but because as you say, um, when you're a beginner and intermediate, you, you probably reach the ceiling of that type or, or that region of the muscle sooner. And, and then as you get more advanced, you kind of need to specifically focus and target different regions. Now that's kind of what, what bodybuilding is all about. You know, now we're beginning to refine our physiques and that that's kind of what they knew already in the sixties and seventies, I, I guess. Yeah. For uh, sure. But do you do you kind of tend to gravitate towards more effort, like proximity to failure, and fewer? It, it sounds like at least fewer sets per exercise, but more exercise variety, and perhaps also from the before and afters that you posted of Josh, uh, including more higher work as well. Yeah, it's really it's really interesting because this is something that has changed with me. So these are some new thoughts that I haven't really shared uh, like on a podcast yet in, in different Ooh, discussion, but interesting. <laughs> it, yeah. So this is the first time these are just new thoughts. Doesn't mean I'm, I'm correct by any means. This is just what I'm currently uh, thinking about and kind of experiencing myself. So yeah. I got into a more high intensity, low volume approach back in like 2020, 2021. And I think it served me really, really well during my contest prep because, I mean, from the visuals and from the data, I basically preserved all of my lean body mass while I was dieting down. Um, However, I've been trying to stick with a very similar training approach since then, and I don't feel like I'm actually progressing that much. So now I'm starting to experiment with doing a little bit more volume, but dropping my intensity on the first one or two sets and then taking it to failure on the third set or whatever it may be. Mm, I'm finding ways to do a little bit more volume right now. And the only way I can do more volume is if I pull back on intensity a tab. Like if I keep my intensity super, super high, 
and I just add in more volume, the quality of work is going to be crap. And I don't think I have the recovery capabilities to sustain that for a long period of time. Mm. But uh, the point I'm trying to make is I, I think it, it can vary depending on what phase you're in. So we do have some literature that shows the amount of volume you need to perform to maintain muscle is way lower than it is to make significant progress in X amount of time. Yep. And I think a lot of bodybuilders can benefit from that train of thought and that approach because when you're dieting and you're prepping, your primary goal should be maintain all the muscle that you currently have and get rid of all the body fat, right? Yep. If you know you can maintain all the muscle you have by doing less work but just keeping the intensity and the quality high, I think that's a really smart thing to consider. Um, mm. because generally speaking, the more sets you do every sing like training in itself is, is catabolic in nature. Like you're breaking down muscle proteins while you're training. So John Meadows used to use an amazing analogy, like every training session, you're digging a ditch and the more you do, or the higher intensity you train at, you're digging a deeper ditch, yeah. depending on what phase you're in, you may or may not have the resources to refill that ditch to get back to baseline and homeostasis and maintenance. And then if you're, you're in a growing phase, you have more resources to kind of have more dirt on top of that ditch and you have excess resources, excess proteins, and now you've made gains, whether it's size, strength, whatever it may be. Mm. So the point I'm trying to make is I think a lot of bodybuilders, if they focus on quality and intensity, during their preps, they can probably get away with lowering their volume. And I think it would serve them well from a muscle preservation standpoint while dieting off the fat. And then what I'm experiencing now is like, maybe it's because I'm in the very later stages of my career. Um, but I feel like this very, this lower volume, high intensity approach isn't serving me super well in my surplus, in my gaining phase. And I'm starting to experiment with doing more volume at slightly lower intensities for some of those working sets and then, you know, pushing some working sets to very high intensity. So I'm just yeah. experimenting with that now. And uh, yeah, it, it, maybe it should vary based on the phase you're in and, and you need to periodize what makes the most sense depending where you're at. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, <clears throat> It's interesting that you mentioned John Meadows because, you know, I consider him a, a good friend and I was working with him many years ago. Oh, that's I amazing. Visit him and just the greatest guy. May he rest in peace. Um, um, and, and I'm kind of partially going to take some credit for introducing him to higher frequencies, which kind of is a good segue into because he, he was kind of just pushing it balls to the wall year round you know, regardless mm. of the off season or on season. And um, so what I kind of wanted to introduce him to was the concept of training each muscle slightly more frequent, but at the same time, you kind of need to account for the added frequency by lowering your volume and or your intensity. And he kind of just, you know, let, let's max out everything. So, so that was, Perhaps not the best idea, and, and he, you know, John was just um, a machine in, in the gym. Yeah. But but do you also see that once you start pushing the volume, becoming more advanced, uh, because for, for some, and again, I'm, I'm going to take some responsibility for introducing higher frequency training to, you know, the training world uh, a few years ago. Um, but, but do you, because my, my thought process was that um, sin, since the muscle protein, uh, protein synthesis is more short-lived, according to the data, um, perhaps we can compensate for that by training each muscle group more often. Now, um, recently, I've kind of gravitated towards um, thinking perhaps... Um, since the more advanced probably needs a stronger stimulus, they're lifting heavier loads, uh, they might even be introducing more inflammation and, and muscle damage by applying that type of stimulus and, and volume. Perhaps 
frequency should actually drop, you know. Mm. And and again, from a bro scientific standpoint, you know, bodybuilders for probably three to four decades now have been training less frequently than than normal. So so what what's your thinking here? Yeah, I think there's a lot of ways to to skin it. Um, I think a lot of ways will work as long as you're managing these variables well. Um, Someone I've learned a lot from is Dr. Scott Stevenson and like his fortitude training. Oh yeah. Does a lot of high frequency stuff as well. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, I mean, it absolutely can work, but then you look at other people in the field and they, they kind of suggest, okay, higher frequencies for beginners and then moderate frequencies for intermediate late stage intermediates approaching the advanced and then very low frequencies for the super advanced. Mm. And again, you, you see both camps kind of produce good results. So I don't have like a super strong answer there. I think as long as you're managing the amount of volume you're doing per session per muscle group, And it allows you to train that muscle 48 hours later, whatever it may be, depending on how you split it up. And that allows you to train it more frequently. I think it absolutely can work. Um, I also think it kind of depends on like what movement patterns you're utilizing. If you're doing a lot of free weight barbell stuff, a lot of compound movements, I don't know if your joints are going to necessarily keep up with you, even if the skeletal muscle system may be able to recover. But if you're doing a bunch of machine work um, and your execution is so good that you're not causing a lot of joint stress, you're not kind of taking that active tension and transferring it to passive tissues um, and like your control at at the end ranges are are good, I think the likelihood of injury or or joint issues is lower. So it depends on so many factors. Um, I've never really experienced experimented with frequencies higher than twice per week. Personally, Mm. um, I have a lot of my females, they, uh, female clients, I'll have them train glutes three times per week. Um, as you know, I think it's pretty common practice for a lot of male clients to train shoulders three times per week. Um, but again, it's not like they're doing a military press or a standing barbell overhead press three times a week. They're doing different lateral raise variations. So, Mm. you know, all that comes into account. Um, And obviously it's, okay, what muscle groups are your weak points? What muscle groups are your strong points? So we don't need to apply this high frequency approach to every muscle group across the board, but it can be a strategy if you want to bring up a weak point or something like that. If you want to experiment with something that you haven't done in the past, that it can be worth it as well. So it's, I think it's worth trying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that, that kind of ties in with like the stimulus <clears throat> to fatigue ratio where some, <clears throat> some perhaps claim that, well, just going to failure is such a fatiguing uh, way to train that it will, you know, require a lot of recovery. Whereas others are more of the opinion perhaps that, well, if you're compensating for a lack of intensity by doing more volume, then that, you know, it, it's still fatiguing. So, you know, can we actually say that one to two hard sets is more or less fatiguing than the equivalent, let's say, four to six sets, more submaximal, perhaps just pushing one or two sets close to failure? I, I mean, this is kind of where where all of the nuances and, and like you say, you know, the different exercise selection where, again, the, the, the rage now, new shiny object is the stretch mediated and lengthened uh, biased movements. Uh, perhaps they're also introducing more muscle damage into the equation, which even though it's more stimulatory, perhaps also requires more recovery. So you're kind of just, you know, one step forward, one step back or something. Um, yeah. Do you have any strong opinions or, or do you have any preferred techniques that, that you consider more effective for uh, getting strong and, and, and muscular? Sure. Yes. Sure. I mean, I, I like utilizing a lot of advanced techniques. I, I program that for, for clients, depending on what phase they're in. Uh, I generally utilize them when they're in caloric surpluses, and we're in gaining phases, and I feel like we have 
more resources to rebuild that tissue where we're creating more damage and more trauma. Um, I'm not a huge fan of doing it when the athlete is 7% body fat and they've been dieting for 12 weeks mm. already. So the usage of intensity techniques vary. <clears throat> I like a lot of different intensity techniques. I like intraset stretching for certain muscle groups and certain exercises. I like uh, something as basic as a drop set for certain exercises, certain muscle groups. I like myo reps from time to time. Um, and if you want to call it long length partials, um, I utilize that every once in a while where it's literally, okay, I can't complete full range of motion as mm. the set progresses. I go from 100% of range of motion to 90%, to 80%, 70%, to 50%. And you're just getting a couple more partial reps at the end of the set. But <clears throat> I haven't really experimented with like just doing that, you know. Mm. Um, speaking of John Meadows, he used to program like one and a halves on like yeah. a, on a hammer strength V squat machine or some sort of squat machine. Yeah. Like a lot of this stuff has been done for a very, very long time. Mm. Um, and it makes sense depending on the movement pattern. So like <clears throat> if you take like a V squat machine, like a hack squat machine, a lot of them at the very top, there's, there's no tension on the muscle. Um, you're kind of just resting and standing there. So yeah, yeah. if you want to do one and a half there, um, obviously you are getting more of a stimulus at that bottom half of the range than you are at the top half of the range. So, yeah. um, I, I think <clears throat> science is amazing. Um, happy to try to play my role in it, but coaching, there's an, there's an art to coaching. It's not just, you're not going to get all your answers by reading scientific literature. Right. Um, there's an art to coaching. There's a communication aspects, interpersonal relationships to consider client preferences. And then like things that we just spoke about before, what's their weak point? What do they need more of? What do they need less of? What mm. can they get away with? You know? So, the the coaching process is super individual and um you know some people say that the scientific literature kind of just gives us where we should probably start um and maybe provides us with boundaries that if you're stepping way outside of these bounds maybe you're kind of missing uh where you should be so mm -hmm. yeah I, I like a lot of intensity techniques though um and i don't necessarily think one is superior to another. Um, I sometimes just rotate them in. So maybe we use X intensity technique on this exercise for four weeks. And then four weeks later, we'd use Y intensity technique on that same exercise for another four weeks. Mm. Um, some of that is literally just to keep it fun for the, for the athlete and provide a novel stimulus from time to time. Um, mm. At the end of the day, I think they, provide similar stimuli and they can provide a similar growth response. So, uh, yeah. again, lots of tools in the toolbox and then you need to designate or pick what tool do you want to use in, in what circumstance? Yeah. And, and do you <clears throat> like as a researcher and you actually study this stuff, do you, do you find that you kind of lean more towards the coaching aspect, the art of coaching and observing each individual client? Or, or do you actually try to find ways to reconcile what you're observing in the lab and, 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 and trying to, you know, basically, it, it, is there anything novel? Is there anything groundbreaking happening in research that should um, change our direction? Or is it kind of just... Same picture, just more detail. I think it's same picture, more detail. So generally speaking, we understand the puzzle that we're working with. Yeah. There's thousands of pieces to this puzzle. And I think with coaching, it's like, all right, you want to make this puzzle work for this individual. Like you, you want to create the physique with this individual sculptor physique a certain way and utilize their own puzzle pieces properly. When it comes to like training as a whole, resistance training, exercise science as a whole, we know that there's a thousand pieces to the puzzle. And I think each new study that comes out just provides us with, oh, well maybe this piece of the puzzle fits slightly better in this area, or you can utilize it in this way. 
um, or, hey, this piece of the puzzle, maybe it's slightly larger than we used to previously think it was. So maybe mm. it's of more importance than we previously thought. So I don't think there's anything like super groundbreaking or super novel, but um, we're trying to get a better understanding of this entire puzzle over time. And I, I think we're moving in the right direction. But because of the whole sh shiny object syndrome that you spoke about before, sometimes people get over-focused on this one piece that's being discussed frequently, and then yeah. they're kind of neglecting all the other things going on. But um, yeah, there's there's really nothing that uh, I think is going to completely change the game. I think, at least from a training technique standpoint, I think... Uh, the field that is really interesting in the next five to 10, 15 years is actually different pieces of exercise equipment. Mm. I think that can be like semi revolutionary, uh, depending on if it becomes more common practice. And if you start seeing these pieces of equipment in commercial gyms or the equipment there has different functions. So that'll be interesting to see, like if you can, utilize the machine that has like a eccentric overload option yeah. or it, it automatically reduces your load based on your concentric velocity. Like that stuff is, is coming. Um, and that's super cool. But again, um, how much of a difference is it going to make in super advanced athletes? It's hard to say, but mm. the cool thing is when, when you are competitive and you're trying to eke out every, piece of potential gains you can make um, that extra one or two or 3% like matters a lot to the advanced person. It's sure. not going to really matter too much to the lay person. So yeah. it depends like who we're talking to and like who's using the equipment. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and also I, I think most tend to forget that, you know, ultimately genes and hormones is, you know, what determines how big and muscular we can, we can actually get. And, um, I think our inborn impatience and fear of missing out and um, instant gratification needs, you know, um, kind of takes away from the fact that building muscle is a slow and consistent process. And and at least, you know, uh, looking at some of your uh, content and, and um, your, your philosophy, and, and I, I, I see a trend there in, in not only yours, but mine as well, and, and successful coaches, that it's more about the slow, consistent chipping away, um, you know, uh, not going on the extreme diets, the, the, the fasting, the protein sparing modified fast, the, the super high volume or super low, uh, and, and just, you know, kind of gradually sculpting that person. Yeah. And, and you know, e even on the diet, you know, you, you instead of thinking I'm, I'm going to get in shape uh, in the next 8 to 12 weeks, you kind of plan out like 20, 30 weeks maybe, even a year, and take your time getting in shape, to having some breaks here and there where you bring up calories a little and, and – uh, that that's I think where the magic is, where, as you say, you know, the art of coaching actually is connected to. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. A lot of people can make great visual progress in you know eight to sixteen to twenty weeks for sure. Like very drastic transformations can occur in that time frame. Hmm. Um, but I think when you're working with more competitive athletes that have bigger goals like some people come to me a year and a half out from a competition or two years out from a competition mm. and we periodize okay what are we going to do for the first six months what are we going to do for from month six to month 12 what are we going to do from month 12 to month 18 and then then we'll finally prep from month 18 to month 24 so if they give me that much time to work with mm. it's going to be a bigger vision but if someone comes to you and and, and they say Hey, I have a goal in 16 weeks. I want to get like as aesthetic and, and as lean as I can by then. It's a different goal. It's a different timeline. So the approach is going to be different. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just, you know, we do live in an age where people want things fast. And I think that's one reason why a lot of people, they might have one trans, like 
they might have one period of their life where they do go through a good physical transformation. They, they crushed it for eight weeks or 16 weeks or something, but you know, mm-hmm. two, three years later, they're not even resistance training anymore. Yeah. They're not really watching their diet anymore and that they, they're not practicing the lifestyle like almost to any degree. Exactly. So, um, yeah, you know, this is another thing I was thinking about. I think it's important to, for people like you and I, to uh, kind of make these distinctions because a lot of people want to do, uh, they want to do like 80% of the work, not 100% of the work, right? They don't want to cross every T and dot every I, but if they can get good results without being a thousand percent dedicated to a craft, that's what a lot of people want. Mm -hmm. On the other end of the spectrum, a competitive athlete wants to make sure they're doing everything possible so they can get a hundred percent of their potential. Good and those point. are two very, very different con- like conversations. Sure. But yeah. I think a lot of times um, like general population clients are like consuming content that's kind of made for the elite athlete yeah. that's Great. really trying Great to point. get the most out of their, their training and their nutrition. So it's important to understand like, Yes, some things are better or closer to optimal, but that doesn't mean it's uh, practically applicable to everyone. So their own context, their own situations, their own goals, their own their their current baseline and starting point, that stuff's super important. So yeah, yeah. It, it makes me wonder, like the, the long length partials are becoming like a, a huge topic of discussion, right? Mm. And I'm seeing like, Oh, like, like you, you might see a comment section that's like flooded with questions or like super intrigued about it. And then I'm like, are all of these people like advanced enough to even care about an advanced technique kind of thing? Right. Or yeah. is it just, is it just like hype right now? Or like the mm. wrong people are paying attention to it or giving it more attention. Makes sense. So anyway, just a thought. No, I mean, that's exactly my thinking that you're probably not at the level or you, you haven't, you know, you, you might be eating like crap, your, your sleep is off, you're overdoing stimulants, you're staying up late. I, I mean, there, there's a ton of stuff that probably matters 99% more than whether you're stretching that muscle on the preacher curl or not. I mean, yeah. Um, it, it, it's kind of majoring in the minors uh, everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And people yeah. also want to but, just be told, you know, um, how many calories and how many sets and, and what exercise. They, they want kind of the template. They don't want yeah. to learn the process. They, they don't want to yeah. be engaged in the actual um, systematic approach to trying something and evaluating progress and then adjusting according to that. And that's kind of where, you know, we need to be focused. For sure. Yeah. They put the cart before the horse, as they say, right? Yeah. So yeah, for sure. So switching gears, um, I'm, I'm going to be aware of time here as well. Um, your, your nutritional, uh, approach, uh, seems like you're um, kind of a fan of higher protein diets, um, having carbs in there to support training intensity. And I can fully support that as well. It's not a carnivore approach. You're not doing ketogenic diets to any major degree, except for perhaps doing some lower carb phases here and there. So um, I'm, I'm just kind of looking at uh, what you have been posting and and, and um, doing with your clients, which has been just some amazing recomp. Uh, Thank you. Processes. So, so could you uh, could you give us some insights, some secrets? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's it's a great question, and there's some. I'm going to talk a lot about protein really quick. <laughs> yeah. I was actually uh, I was on a I was on a podcast yesterday. And I didn't get the, my points across the way I wanted to. And then afterwards, I thought about how I can explain it. So I can probably like perfectly explain it right now. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah. All right. So I'm going to start zoomed in and then work my way zoomed out for today's discussion where most people start zoomed out and then zoom in. So for mm, example, that's good. 
most people, like you just said, they, they want to know how many calories they're eating. So they determine calories first, then they determine protein intake and their macronutrient intake. Then they'll consider, okay, how many meals per day am I going to eat? What my, what my meal frequency is going to look like and what my meal timing and nutrient timing is going to look like. That's generally how people program nutrition. And so do I in some ways. One reason why my protein recommendations are so much higher than a lot of other people is sort of based, it is based on the scientific literature in some ways. Um, and it's also based on just experience as a coach and what I see. So if we start super zoomed in on protein intake, mm -hmm. there was studies done by uh, Stu Phillips, where we understand that leucine is a key amino acid to initiate the muscle protein synthetic response. And you need all you need the other eight essential amino acids, you need all nine essential amino acids to keep that process fueling. So you need a proper quantity of protein, total protein, and you also do need a specific quantity of leucine, isoleucine, valine, and all the essential amino acids to get the most muscle protein synthesis possible. Mm. So the reason I'm talking about this now is because you may have heard, oh, as long as you consume 20 to 30 grams of protein in a feeding, that is sufficient enough to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Um, and as long as you do that a couple times a day, you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> when I hear those suggestions being made and those very black and white statements being made by the same individuals, it makes zero sense to me because mm -hmm. they'll say, as long as you eat 20 to 30 grams of protein and you do that a couple times per day, so let's just call it two to four times per day, yeah. you're fine. I also don't know anybody that prescribes 40 to 120 grams of protein for most of their, their male clients, let's say. But if you use that 20 to 30 gram rule two to four times per day, that's where you end up. So it makes zero sense when I, when I hear those statements. Um, so when we zoom in and we're, we're talking about trying to maximize the anabolic response of each meal, Dr. Stu Phillips found that you need approximately 0 0.045 grams of leucine per kilogram of total body weight. So what does that actually mean in terms of protein sources that you're consuming? For someone like myself, that's 175 pounds. I would need to consume about 35 grams of whey protein, which is really, really rich in leucine to maximize that response or to Good get point. that amount of leucine. And, and most if research I were to have, use whey protein just to make most that research clear. uses yeah. whey. If I were to use an animal meat like chicken or beef, I would actually need to have closer to 50, 55 grams of protein to get the same amount of leucine. Hmm. So, and I'm only 175 pounds. I'm not like a 220 pound, like jacked person, right? Mm. Um, the reason that 20 to 30 gram number has been recommended so often is because the literature that supported that oftentimes was done through muscle biopsies. They're looking at fractional synthetic rates of muscle protein synthesis, but they had subjects perform maybe three or four sets of leg extension on one side. They did the biopsy, they provided the protein, and, and that showed that 20 to 30 -ish grams maximized the response there. Yeah. That's true if you're just training one muscle and you're just doing one exercise. And that's also true maybe if, you're, if your subjects weighed, I don't know, 65 kilos and they didn't have a lot of you know, lean body mass, for example. Right. So you need to scale that depending on the size of the individual. Mm. Um, so like I, I made a post the other day, I left a comment the other day that I need to expand upon, but I was like the 20 to 30 gram suggestion is only appropriate for like females that are 140 pounds and below. Mm. Like otherwise, like that suggestion needs to get thrown away. The yeah. average male in America weighs like 210 pounds between the ages of 30 and 39. So like my demographic, Yeah, I think saying you should aim for 35 to 50 grams of protein three plus times per day mm. is way more appropriate just as like a blanket statement, blanket recommendation. I think that makes a lot more sense. All right. Yeah. So sorry for the rant, but I'm going to, I'm going to keep going down. No, the that's ladder great. Awesome. Mind. Yeah. 
All right, cool. Keep going. So you need to understand how much protein you need uh, and the quality of amino acids you need per meal to maximize the protein synthetic response of that meal. Cool. So for someone like you and I, it's probably going to be between 35 to 55 grams of protein per meal. And then you can work your way down the pyramid, the opposite direction. Then you can ask, all right, how many meals per day works really well for your schedule? Um, and depending on what phase you're in, that can change too. So for example, when I'm cutting, I personally like having fewer, very large meals that keep me satiated. So I generally do four meals when I'm cutting. However, when I'm bulking, I just can't get in enough calories and my appetite and my digestion won't be good if I'm not having five or six meals. So my meal frequency goes up depending on whether I'm cutting or bulking. Great. So then yeah. you can say, all right, if I'm having approximately 50 grams of protein per meal, that can range from, you know, 200 grams of protein per day, maybe up to 250 grams of protein per day, depending on what phase I'm in, just as an example. So then you talk about meal frequency, how many times per day then you want do you want to eat? And then you can start figuring out, okay, what are my fats and carbs going to look like, depending on my caloric needs, my activity levels, my training demands, so on and so forth. So in the past, I would always, I, and I still teach like setting up someone's diet, determine calories, then determine macronutrients, then figure everything else out. But just to talk about protein and provide the point I was trying to make, um, I think there's benefits of, of higher protein diets. And I do think that there may be benefits to slightly increased meal frequency. Um, the same way you kind of mentioned in advanced trainees, if muscle protein synthesis only lasts for eight to 32 hours, mm. you know, you kind of hypothesize that maybe a higher frequency training would be beneficial. Another thing I find super interesting is someone in the evidence-based space may say, it doesn't really matter if you eat one meal or four meals per day, as long as your total oh, calories total, and your total, total protein yeah. intake is the same. Yeah. And then sometimes they say, however, I suggest that you have at least three or four feedings per day. So they like, yeah, yeah. they like counteract their previous statement or something they've previously said. Just and again, it matters basically. Yeah. 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 It, it mm -hmm. depends who you're talking to. If I'm talking to, you know, John Smith, that is a middle-aged man and just wants to improve his body composition. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he can get great results if he's progressively resistance training and he's eating three meals per day that have yes. a sufficient amount of protein. I just add, pro a, just add protein to, you know, gen pop and things yeah. will improve. Things well, will improve. Automatically. Yeah. yeah. But if I'm talking to, you know, Josh Bradshaw or I'm talking to a, a high level client and an athlete that's trying to maximize things, then the, the suggestions and the recommendations are going to be a little different. And uh, it's going to be harder to sustain. It's going to be more of a pain in the butt from a lifestyle factor. Mm. But if those are the goals and, and that's where you're at, then you consider, you know, potentially applying that. Yeah. Yeah. Those are some very interesting insights. I, I also uh, completely resonate with um, lowering meal frequency as you're dieting, just, you know, mm. having to go below 2000 calories on five to six meals per day is just, you know, ridiculous. So mm -hmm. having four, maybe even three larger meals just, you know, kind of satiates you better at that point. Yeah. Um, but as far as, um, you know, macro levers, do you have any preference for what to adjust and, and, and pull whenever you're getting deep into contest prep? Yeah, for sure. So, um, once calories are determined and proteins determined, I also provide like my general recommendations for protein intake. So um, I generally recommend 1.2 to 1.6 grams of protein per pound of lean mass. Um, mm. Off lean the top mass, of my head. Just, I, yeah. Just off of lean mass. Yeah. Emphasize that. Yeah. And people don't need to overstress that. So if you don't know if you're 13% or 17%, you can just guesstimate and say you're 15% or 20%. Like it doesn't need yeah. to be perfect. Right. Um, but you can get in the ballpark. Um, mm -hmm. Generally speaking, once once I'm you know in a fat loss phase with a client, the first thing that's going to move is carbohydrate intake is going to drop a little bit, and fat intake might drop a little bit as well. Those are the first levers that I pull. Um, protein intake stays relatively high throughout. 
Um, and then another point that I like to make is when someone is bulking and in a caloric surplus, if, if I'm working with someone and they're just tracking macros, their protein usually tends to climb up as their carbs and fat go up over time because they're consuming more trace proteins from the, the carbohydrates that yeah. don't have a good amino acid profile. Mm -hmm. So I don't want them to eat less animal protein just because right. yeah. they're eating more total calories. So like Definitely. there's a big difference. If someone's consuming 300 of, 350 grams of carbs in a, in a lean bulking or in a bulking phase versus 200 grams of carbs in a cutting phase, they might be getting another 40 to 50 grams of trace protein from the carbohydrates they're consuming. Right. I don't want that to decrease their animal protein that they're consuming. So protein can scale up or down depending on whether they're cutting or bulking. Mm. Um, but yeah, carbs are the first thing I pull. Um, I also periodize a little bit like training days versus non-training days, depending on the timeline. I like to be um, a little bit more aggressive on non-training days. So their mm. calories are a little bit lower. Their carbohydrate intake is a little bit lower. Um, those do you are just some like general things fats to talk about. accordingly, or do you tend to keep that constant? Um, fats are usually just a little bit higher on non-training days, and then carbs mm. are moderately lower on non-training days, yeah. generally speaking. Great. Yeah. All right. Uh, and also, uh, from what I understand, you just um, take your time getting someone in shape. So it's it's not like dropping two pounds per week, uh, except for perhaps in the beginning. So just kind of slowly getting in shape and, and perhaps even rebounding or, or uh, trying to bring calories slightly up again as they get closer to, to contests. Yeah, it depends. Um, that's another area I think the pendulum might have swung a little bit too far in, in I don't want to say the wrong direction, it's just the extremes, right? So yeah. I like people used to used to contest prep in eight to twelve weeks. Yeah. Um <laughs> for ninety five percent of the population, that's not enough time. There is a select few that can get the job done in a very short period of time. Um on the other end of the spectrum, I think if you're dieting for thirty four 40 weeks i also think your prep is just way too long yeah um, i think it can be really psychologically taxing um it can be very physiologically taxing and that can also not be a good thing um so it depends on where you start how much body fat you have to lose i i guess i, I like kind of being more in the middle when it comes to a lot of things um yeah. i'm not i try not to be too extreme on either side but there are some individuals that can pull things off and, and get contest lean in eight weeks. And yeah, they're probably relatively lean in their off season. So like mm. for that person, if I were to diet them down for 20, they would probably bring a less impressive physique to the stage um, than if they dieted down for 12. Whereas if somebody needs 20 or 24 weeks and you try to do it in 12 or 16, they're not going to bring their best to the stage either. So very, very context dependent. Um, I like taking a slower approach with females, generally speaking. And I, I like taking a slightly more aggressive approach with, with most males, but it's very, very individual, man. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I, I tend to try to target like uh, half a kilo per week or, or thereabouts. And as they get lean or try to kind of slow things down a little and, and, you know, see how they respond to carb manipulations and kind of get the feel for, yeah. especially if a first time competitor, what, well, what's, you know, uh, their, their, um, final week prep going to look like their, their, um, peaking strategy. And, and yeah. That's uh, you know a different ball game altogether. So I'm, I'm not going to start um, asking about that because that would be an entire podcast. Yeah, yeah. One thing I will say that seems to work very, very well for a lot of clients is um, as they get leaner and closer to to stage condition, I like to actually increase their calories quite a bit on training days, um, mm. like really close to theoretical maintenance. So they might get like 150 calorie, 300 calorie bump on training days. Um, but 
I still keep their non-training days like super aggressive from a, a, a deficit standpoint. Like they might be in a 500 calorie deficit on a non-training day, but they might be at maintenance on a training day. So, you know, when you look at the entire week, they're still in a net deficit when you look at the entire week, but because the calories have been brought up on training days, their performance is better, their recovery is better. Um, and they, they just feel way, way better. So that probably helps with muscle preservation as they're leaner, um, because it allows them to a have better training performance, but b also not necessarily be in a deficit and in a catabolic environment, but more around that maintenance. So mm. that ditch that they're digging, they're like, they're refilling it. Yeah. As yeah. Well. yeah. Makes a lot of yeah, sense. So I yeah. like that a lot. Yeah. Me too. Me too. I, I, I've done that intuitively before and worked really well. So not yeah. on myself, I tend to just, uh, be an idiot when it comes to my own prep, which is why I kind of outsource it. Yeah, but, worked, uh, with, worked with Cliff. Yeah, yeah. I, I started working with Cliff like 16, That's 17 awesome. weeks ago now. So I'm, I'm going to just... Very cool. Yeah, it's perfect to have someone to spar with and discuss things with. And, hey, I'm thinking this. And he's like, nah, maybe not. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good to have someone in your corner to, um, you know, uh, brain dump with sometimes. For sure. For sure. Um, all right. So uh, I guess we'll just wrap things up. I think this has been a great uh, discussion. Um, going off of what you said earlier, is there anything that you would like to expand on that I haven't asked you? No, not necessarily, man. Uh, I really enjoyed the conversation. It was, it was a pleasure to connect with you this yeah, way. Uh, likewise. Through the video call and... Yeah, I hope the audience got some good pieces of information that they can practically uh, apply and, you know, at least consider. So, yeah, mm. thanks for having me on today. And uh, I look forward to maybe doing this again in the future. Oh, yeah, me too. I mean, this was really, uh, I, I, I learned a, a thing or two myself. So I got some very good perspectives on it and reminded of stuff I had been um, experiencing before, but perhaps not connected. So... Yeah, I, I thank you for that. Um, now, pleasure. where can people find you? Do you have any uh, products? Do you have anything where people can learn your stuff from? Yeah. Um, so my website, schoolofgains.com, gains is spelt with a Z. Um, on there, there are some resources, um, some, some uh, educational resources that are free. Also, some paid products like training programs or uh, a nutritional ebook like exactly how I kind of set up my clients diets. Um, and then there's just more, more information, free articles on there and whatnot. And obviously coaching services can be, um, you know, discussed over there and found over there. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of social media, um, I'm most active on Instagram, even though I'm not super active, uh, on that platform anymore, but it's just my full name. It's just at Christopher dot mm -hmm. And yeah, if you guys have any questions, feel free to DM me on uh, Instagram or uh, shoot me a message through the website. You can inquire through the website and uh, I'll connect with you via email. But um, I'll also, you know, kind of take a peek at the comment section here um, for this podcast. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to leave a comment and I will do my best to get back to the comments here. So, yeah, thank you for tuning in and, and thanks again for having me on. I appreciate it. Awesome. Uh, I'll be sure to put links in the description below. Cool. Thank you so much. And it was an honor and a pleasure. Uh, Thank best, you. Best wishes. Thanks.